Okay, so now we've got a better scope of the investing landscape for the next few months. At least it gives you guys some conversation starters when you go out and network with the other delegates. Now we're going to turn our head over to decentralized exchanges and what the future holds for them, but also the integrations with banking products, some of the challenges that lay in between the hurdles and maybe how Web3 can come involved as well. So I'm going to hand the floor to our speakers now. Can we have a big round of applause for our next conversation? Hi guys, my name's Robert Mowry. I teach the Blockchain Technology Management Certificate Program at UCL Extension. I'm Corey Kaplan. I'm one of the co-founders of Dolomite. We're building a decentralized margin lending and trading protocol. Hey everyone, Clenthia May. I'm one of the co-founders at Masa. We're building Web3's Sobom Identity Protocol. So in the context of banking, I thought it was interesting that there's a lot being done with the JP Morgan Onyx project. You may have read that the Singapore Central Banking Authority is pushing forward with their uh, project Guardian, which really uses a forked version of the Aave Arc protocol as well as a forked uh, V2 of the Uniswap protocol. And they've been doing some interesting tests with Forex that would allow different parties to send over the Singapore dollar as well as the Japanese yen, and that uh, was successful when they executed that. And they're also doing securitizations of government bonds, and that has been effective. And the real pain point that I'm seeing from the DeFi standards is that a lot of the traditional wholesale banking institutions are having difficulty not knowing their counterparties. So they understand that the protocol itself can be helpful in being able to have the execution of the trade go through, but they're still not confident that the other side will perform. And so I think that these two platforms are very interesting in that they attack problems that are being very deeply felt right now. The way that the Onyx program is moving forward with things is that they're using an intermediary layer. They're essentially having the other side be vetted uh, by using the permission of blockchain. So being able to touch and s have a counterparty that you can vet is for them uh, instrumental in their process. And when it comes to uh, Masa Finance, what's really interesting about uh, your platform is that you're attacking the big uh, or the challenge that they're facing with these walled gardens. and introducing that type of a KYC or uh, transparency. And I know you're using some interesting uh, zero knowledge proofs that uh, keep the data that you want to protect for yourself not out there, as well as having deep uh, implications for uh, being able to vote in DAO context. So can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in terms of uh, the KYC for individual users? Yeah, sure, absolutely happy to. Um, so first of all, I think in general, I am supportive and inspired by institutional liquidity providers wanting to get into the DeFi paradigm. I believe DeFi, and I'm sure Corey agrees with me as well, can bring a lot of uh, benefits to real-world assets, including extreme capital efficiency, but also be able to broaden liquidity in an open and interoperable network. However, as you mentioned, Robert, Identity is such a crucial missing piece when it comes to this new internet native decentralized finance paradigm right now. Bear in mind that crypto is pseudonymous. So that requires a complete rethink when it comes to how we know your customer, know your business, and how we assess risks associated with individuals and entities. That's the big question I think we're facing right now. But the huge caveat here is that uh, true to form, to TradFi, a lot of people want to take baby steps when it comes to taking part in DeFi, however, still wanting to take the world garden approach, having a centralized intermediary between KYC, yourself, and your true end users. I think we can actually do it better in a different way. Here at Masa, what we're doing is that we're helping individuals establish their on-chain identity, however, we still empower users to own their own identity. So for institutions, they'll be able to see an encrypted and hash attestation of whether that person has been KYC'd, yes or no, instead of actually processing the PII of end users. For us, 
that is enabling end users to be able to own their identity, but at the same time, still providing a degree of comfort for institutional liquidity providers to participate in this new market. Yeah, I think the two reasons why people enroll in my coursework is number one, because we're in Los Angeles and get a lot of Los Angelinos is NFTs. You can see on the conference room floor that it's about half NFT projects that are doing interesting things. And then certainly DeFi. So we get bankers that are trying to be on the cutting edge of their digitization movement and be like the go-to person at their branch on when things are pivoting over. But I saw that with your project that you got investment from the well-regarded digital currency group and a lot of institutional players. So like what's their appetite when you've been talking to them in terms of this technology being deployed like on a retail or a wholesale level? Well, every project needs an identity. <laughs> so when we talk to DCG, they have around 300 projects in their investment portfolio, and they're constantly thinking about what are some fundamental missing blocks in the world of DeFi, Web3, and NFT at large to them identity really stuck out as one of the key missing pieces. That's the reason why when they saw Masa, they wanted to chat more. And then in the identity space, we roughly have DID, VC, and SBT, Sobon Tokens. Sobon Tokens, for those who are not familiar, is a concept that was first evangelized by Vitalik, Ethereum's uh, creator in May, in a paper called Decentralized Society. So I often describe Sobon token or Sobon identity as building an onion, right? We are building different layers of onions. With each layer, we have data attribute so linked to an individual, user, or entity. And holistically, we'll be able to use the onion to represent someone's on-chain identity. However, we do that in the privacy first way, meaning that you can only request permission to that specific layer of onion without seeing the rest of someone's on-chain identity. For financial information, that is really critical. What are the two most exciting uh, applications of on-chain identities that you think really resonated when you went out and did your successful round? Yeah, um, for me and for my co-founder, we're both immigrants here in the US. When we started Masa, what we had in mind is really an open and equitable and truly borderless financial system one of the key problems with global financial system right now is that there are billions of people who are credit invisible, meaning that they might be credit worthy. However, their credit worthiness is not correctly reflected in traditional banking and traditional financial institution. Here at Masa, what we want to do is that we want to help those credit invisible individuals establish their identity on chain and to be able to tap into this new global liquidity pool that we're creating. So that is one very exciting use case for us personally. The second one is really Sybil attack and how to prevent Sybil attack, meaning how to prevent duplicate identities in the new on chain paradigm. Right now in the current market environment, airdrops is really on trend, right? But when we think about airdrops, specifically allow list, Sybil attack is a core problem there. How do we make sure that we do not have multiple people, a person creating multiple identities and trying to claim multiple spots on the allow list? That is something that we think about as a project as we launch airdrop, which is dropping later today, by the way, a shameless plug here, and doing NFT. But at the same time, we want to externalize the same kind of infrastructure and technology to help other projects prevent civil attack in this new world. Yeah, this is a, a deeply needed area. You're seeing Circle and um, MetaMask Institutional that are getting together that are trying to put something on chain that can get institutional coverage when people do start to roll out more of these uh, stablecoin products. But do you think that there is um, a heavy-handed way of going about this or a light touch? Or how do you think that from the individual's um, perspective, they should be looking at uh, having their identity on chain? Yeah, I think it has to align with the Web3 ESOs. Again, uh, going back to your first question, Robert, about world garden versus a user-centric approach when it comes to on-chain identity, I am firmly in the latter. That's the reason why we're building this new world of Web3 and DeFi, right? If we're still having centralized intermediaries owning your identity in a centralized database, why are we doing that at all? We want to build a truly open and interoperable financial network. That's the reason why I'm firmly in the latter camp. 
And uh, to your question about the circle news, in general, I'm super encouraged by a lot of people who want to think of privacy preserving way of establishing a user's on-chain identity. So I'm definitely encouraged by the news. And then there are some fundamental technical differences when it comes to what they're building versus what we're building. What they're building, uh, based on my brief understanding of their website and press releases, is based on DID versus us based on SBT. DID versus SBT, for those technical audience um, down there, uh, feel free to take a look. But from my perspective, SBT is far more composable when it comes to DID. DID currently encompasses a huge array of different kind of use cases without a very simple way to implement. That is making establishing on, on identity on chain very hard, right? Because you want to have practical interoperability when it comes to helping someone establish their on-chain identity. In our view, SBT achieves that, but still, I really love seeing what they're doing, and I want to see more of it from other peers in the ecosystem. That's beautifully articulated, and it sounds like your project is, um, from what I've seen, doing some amazing things, and we're excited about what you're rolling out in the future. Fingers crossed, and uh, we're launching DevNet. If anyone who's technical, non-technical, wants to play with our SDK CLI, let me know, you know where to find me. We'd love to give you a spin. You know, and there's a lot that's being done with DeFi for on-chain trading, and it's great to have the co-founder of Dolomite here because you're seeing a lot of centralization with these trading platforms, and even when these platforms will go down, they'll settle with DeFi. So all of the centralized exchanges, with Celsius and everything, you're seeing when the chips fall that the transactions are being done on Uniswap and being done on protocols that have been time tested. And when it comes to platforms that allow you to jump on board, to trade, to trade from a pool and to trade from a, um, a trusted way, I think that an approach that you're taking with your pool is real innovative and I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about how you're using the vast array of technologies that I really haven't seen before on your platform and has been really interesting to use and, and test out. Well, building a, a decentralized exchange that's inherently trustless is a really difficult process because it doesn't just revolve around the smart contracts that facilitate settlement of the trades. It also revolves around the data that's presented on the website for users to better understand the the execution of the trade, what goes into the actual routing for it, um, potentially who the counterparty is, if it's an automated pool or if it's more P2P. Um, but with that, we have chain link data that's responsible for doing collateral calculations. We have data that gets indexed from the chain, as you heard from the previous talk. We use that um, through the graph protocol. And the key point, though, is that if you look at a technical stack for any modern day DeFi application, it doesn't just revolve around the smart contracts. There's other key points that are responsible for presenting that data to the user, and we wanted to make sure that any point in that process didn't have a point of centralization, which means that uh, in the worst of times when there's market turmoil or black swan events from crazy price movements, insolvencies, or other kind of scary scenarios, decentralization has proven to be the bedrock for uh, facilitating trust in a otherwise scary environment. Um, we've seen back in like, for example, May of 2021, when uh, Ethereum had hit about $4,200, um, and a lot of altcoins were booming that day. Shortly thereafter, a lot of token prices started plummeting a couple days later, and we had a good negative 25%, negative 50% day at its deepest point. That kind of market activity cause a lot of centralized exchanges to go down. But the ones that existed in the purely decentralized world did not. And that's the kind of certainty that we want to give to our users, that even in the worst of times, we can be there for them. So when you traditionally think about DeFi, you'll think about automated market makers and what uh, Hayden Adams did with Uniswap in the early days. And you do have on-chain uh, order books and people are trying interesting things there, but really in practical application, centralized databases it seem like for the speed of execution are good for on-chain order books. But you've taken the decisive approach that I think makes a lot of sense to use 
the um, Chainlink Oracle as the arbiter of the price, and I know they use like eight certain, uh, eight different determinants of a price and we'll meet the middle ground. Like what in your mind is the benefit of using a, a well-trusted Oracle as the price determinant when you're presenting a specific price to open a, a position for uh, in this type of trading? Yeah, so taking a step back to break down a bit more of what he said also, um, we're looking to use Chainlink Oracles for essentially an RFQ or re request for quote system that will allow users to open up trades against an automated pool in a very efficient way that reflects the true market price. And what's really important about this kind of style of trading is that it will allow for much deeper liquidity for on-chain trading that reflects whatever the current view of the market is at that moment in time. And it's really important for allowing for better execution in a DeFi sense because even though these centralized systems are much faster, we found that users are still willing to pay the trade-off of potentially slower execution slash settlement or potentially worse fees in exchange for that additional security because you know, there is no free lunch in this world and people are usually paying for some kind of trade-off. So using a chain link-like system that allows us to get more trustless access to whatever the current market price is allows us to offer much deeper liquidity for those larger trades that want to go through without necessarily dealing with crazy amounts of slippage or other ways that the trade execution process can be hampered by a uh, larger settlement. Yeah, my Twitter is uh, at wrecked, so I'm well aware of getting wrecked <laughs> on various exchanges. And remember in the early days of FTX that their real innovation to the centralized uh, area was that their order engine was much more dynamic, but even then you can bulk uh, send in a bunch of long positions and you can close out an order book in pretty uh, short order. So they're moving forward a little bit with their 3X tokens and then are using those as ERC-20s and then putting them on liquidity pools. So people are trying interesting things there. But in many ways, your platform allows a person to go in, log in with their wallet, do the trades that they want to trade, keep them open um, for a very favorable uh, APR I was looking at, and then have those run uh, essentially indefinitely in until it reaches a point at which it would get closed out and so they can open a trade and keep it open, and then as long as they have access to their wallet, then uh, they can profit from that position, essentially. Yeah, and two important aspects of it would be we use that chain link computation for the price to dictate if your position is going to go underwater for actually performing those li uh, liquidations then. And that's an important distinction from the way that other exchanges might operate when they want to force close a position out. We've heard the horror stories from various exchanges that have these wicks where some large player either executes a large buy or a large sell, moves the price on one exchange, and unfortunately your position was in the, uh, the shark's mouth of getting chomped up by these people that were stop loss hunting you um, or looking to liquidate your position. Having a more holistic view of the market with Chainlink allows us to operate on a much more level playing field that requires broad market movement instead of one idle or siloed exchange movement in order to actually close a position out. But with that, the way our system works as well, it's inherently uh, uh, predicated on spot settlement of assets. We're not dealing with anything synthetic with what we have built so far, which means that all the assets are actually changing hands. And when you borrow USDC to purchase more Ethereum and therefore lever up for your position or open up a very simple borrow, you're doing that with real assets and you're getting access to real spot rates for whatever assets you're borrowing. It's not predicated on some funding rate that can wildly swing and might also force you out of your position because you're paying 40% APR per year, or potentially more than that, depending on how they calculate notional value and where the actual APR is predicated on. But with that, the other key takeaway from this would be that we're in an environment where <clears throat> all the uh, computation, all the trading is being done in a trustless way between counterparties. We don't need to necessarily uh, rely upon credit checks or identity for what we're doing as of right now. But as we get into solutions that were being talked about beforehand, it will allow us to unlock other capabilities like under collateralized lending that require uh, credit checks because you can't necessarily give someone more money than you know, they would be able to run away with from the platform otherwise or else they would just drain the entire system. 
So decentralized credit checks are an important bedrock for unlocking more use cases with platforms like ours. Yeah, if I may add here, I 100% agree. If we think about the current DeFi paradigm and how we tap into the next step, right? For me, for DeFi to be leveraged in real world asset, it's a huge value unlock. You'll be able to not only lend to the Web3 natives and the participants in DeFi ecosystem, but also to people, to the Web2 people, the next billion users, as we speak of, and to help them get access to credit. Um, last year, we ran some V1 experiments when it comes to um, the need for access to capital at a global scale. With a value proposition, we're able to onboard more than 35,000 users very easily because across the globe, again, there's an issue of credit invisibility due to design flaws in the traditional financial system. How to serve those credit invisible people using DeFi, decentralized credit check, solves a problem, at least provides the first step in solving the problem. Yeah, from my perspective, I've seen about two ways so far. I failed to see a third, but I'm looking forward to maybe someone cracking that barrier of how we can actually offer under collateralized lending to the masses in a DeFi realm where, where there's no more walled gardens. The first would be these credit checks that we're talking about that allow people to tie their identity to their position of actually borrowing assets. The second way, which is much more restrictive, but it's still a different use case for it, would be allowed for under, under collateralized lending, but in a more permissioned environment. You can only use those funds in certain environments or certain ways that would restrict you from running off with the money and essentially stealing it, but you could still use it in a uh, couple of predefined use cases that ensures that the funds aren't going to disappear. So this could mean, for example, opening up a position where you might get liquidated if the price of Ethereum drops to $1,000, for the sake of example, let's say it's trading at 1500 right now. I've seen a use case pop up, which is super interesting, that actually allows someone to use um, an open option position to essentially uh, use a put option to collateralize themselves if the price went below $1,000. So instead of getting liquidated, they actually move the funds around from the option to actually keep themselves in an over collateralized status, preventing that liquidation from occurring. These are some really wacky scenarios that are really hard to explain. And I'm sitting here on stage trying to explain it to everyone right now. But the point though is that credit solutions like she's building make a really big difference for breaking down what could have been really tough concepts for users and institutions to understand to make it much more relatable and used in a much broader sense. Yeah, we are really hoping to build the third option that in the future everyone can use here, which is a more interoperable way of establishing your financial identity on chain, which not only means spot check soft pull at the point of applying for a lending product, but also helping you establish your repayment history on chain. Because currently, you can, of course, take some loan in one system, but what if you go to trade on another platform, then your repayment history is not uh, accompanying you as you move around in this DeFi paradigm. What we're trying to do at Masa is the opposite, trying to create a more interoperable way for people to build financial identity on chain. Yeah, you're also seeing a little bit of delegated authority too. So someone that might have a substantial amount of crypto that would be able to, on certain platforms, say that this user is whitelisted as trustworthy or they have connections. Um, I'd be interested in if either of you have thoughts on that. I know the TrueFi platform does something all on an institutional level where they'll give like 30-day loans of sizable amounts to institutions because they know that they have uh, deep LP bases and they are very probable to pay back those loans, so. Well, I mean, think, looking at it from a decentralized perspective, if we move those <clears throat> loans from that environment to, de to the decentralized world in DeFi, we can get a better sense for who these loans are, are give, being given out to and also have a better track record of double spending that might be going on. I mean, we saw this earlier this past year with the 3AC contagion from various parties that were interacting with them. And it's, it was a classic double spending environment. If they did a lot of those loans using you know, blockchain technology, smart contracts for actually facilitating them, even though they were under collateralized loans, it would have been much easier to keep track of who the counterparties were, you know, were they going to potentially double borrow, double spend these funds, and at least get rid of the low-hanging fruit environment where people were just very classically taking money and that wasn't rightfully theirs or you know, putting collateral up for grabs that was already up for grabs by some other party. 
Um, yeah, I fully agree. I think that's the key difference when it comes to true DeFi and CDFI, right? Like how we still have centralized authority intermediating the entire system um, and preventing the true transparency being uh, registered on the blockchain. And if we think about it, if we can extend this extreme capital efficiency to the broader world, we can unlock so much potential there. At its peak in December 2021, DeFi reached around $180 billion in total value log, which was a huge accomplishment for the entire ecosystem. But in comparison to the traditional financial space, global fixed income market, for instance, has around $170, $127 trillion in value. That's the goal we're going for. How we extend DeFi to capture the real world assets in CeFi? Yeah, and it's extremely important that as we build out this system, we understand the breakdown between where parties should be working in a more trustless environment where they don't need to necessarily trust or know each other to work with one another, or situations where there you know, needs to be trust put in place. It's being done in a sensible way where there isn't necessarily personal information being leaked or people aren't able to obfuscate or hide their previous history or other positions they might have available. I mean, with the TrueFi example, it's very easy to mention a second centralized exchange that offers a similar service. And in a lot of situations, because these centralized exchanges unfortunately operate like walled gardens, you can go from one exchange to another saying, I'm this high net worth individual, I have all these assets under management, I wanna go borrow $10 million from this exchange and then go back over to TrueFi and borrow another $10 million. And of course, you can very easily sign a contract that says you know, we're, we're not pledging the same assets to the same exchanges, but that doesn't necessarily stop people from committing fraud. They still will do it anyway. And we saw that happen, which led to a very large credit meltdown in the credit, I'm sorry, in the crypto industry. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things about the three arrows is they're double committing or triple committing their collateral. So however they can um, show their on-chain assets to multiple lenders and get what they wanna get, um, they're happy to do so. So I'd love to open it up for questions. I know on the conference room floor, there's a lot of discussion being done about on-chain identities, people that are doing trading or trying to do trading that's light on KYC AML. So uh, anyone that wants to um, answer a question, I'd love to host that. Uh, or if not, I have a bunch more. So I think there's some microphones circling right yeah. in the front here. Yeah, while those microphones go around. I think that I'd like to know, to close it out, what your thoughts are on the bridging of TradFi and DeFi. So all these banks, especially the fintech banks, are trying to dip their toe and get in with some of the significant deposits that Circle is seeing to the order, I think 50 to 60 billion. And I saw they're gonna try to do a raise with a reverse merger or something with a SPAC. But what do you think that um, that bridging could uh, best come about in, in the way that would most respect the individual users and make, um, as was mentioned earlier, like the ecosystem feel most accepting of these new entrants to the space? I think in a broad sense, to the extent that some of these parties need to operate you know, with a KYC AML environment where they know who their counterparty is, that's going to, of course, continue to be built and operate in this environment where smart contracts are used and they gain those benefits. But there's also going to be some environments or situations where it makes sense for them to interact with this decentralized world. And it's not necessarily the decentralized products that are masquerading as being decentralized, but they're really not. It's going to be them interacting with the Dolomites, the Uniswaps, the Aves of the world that have deep liquidity where they can use it for potentially clearing funds or settling large positions. And being able to tap into that liquidity is going to be, going to be very important to them, especially as liquidity continues to balloon back upward from where it is now to its bull market highs. And to those thinking that it's going to be impossible for some of, the, some of those traditional finance funds to interact with it, there's of course a plethora of reasons that that's going to be true, but what's important to consider is that we're always one layer of abstraction away from someone doing that. There's going to be some fund set up that's able to arbitrage the difference between what exists in DeFi and how you can settle funds there or trades there that's able to interact with the regulated world. 
So maybe some traditional finance firms won't be interacting with DeFi directly, going on with their MetaMask and actually executing a trade on Uniswap, but maybe they'll do it with a regulated institution that has been KYC AML, they know who their counterparty is, and that KYC AML institution is able to interact with DeFi then and actually settle trades that way. So it's done through layers of abstraction then. And the key point then with this uh, scenario is that DeFi exists as a bedrock or a base foundation for various institutions to interact with either directly or indirectly. The liquidity that's building up there is going to be impossible to ignore, especially as it grows from where it is now. I 100% agree with you, Corey. And personally, I have worked in TradFi. I have worked in FinTech for nine years before I got into DeFi. And what really attracts me about DeFi is the promise of building a true open interoperable network with plenty of liquidity. In my dream, I always wanted to build a global debt capital market. And I think DeFi provides a building block that enables it. While I see encouraging signs of financial institutions trying to um, take baby, baby steps into this world, and it's great that we're increasing the awareness, the adoption of crypto at large um, in, for the next billion user, I really hope that we can better educate everyone in the ecosystem and really truly be on this spectrum of progressive decentralization and eventually be able to tap into the promised land, the open, interoperable liquidity network that DeFi provides. There are better ways to do KYC than just storing everyone's PII in one centralized database. And we hope that at Massa Finance, we can provide a better alternative to do that. That's great. Yeah, I really appreciate talking with you two today. Those were very instructive points that you were all making, and you're very well seasoned in the space, and it shows. And I think for me, if you're interested in touching base with me, I'm at Rect on Twitter. And then for the both of you, I'd be interested to know um, how people can sign up for your site and get involved, and maybe just a little takeaway about the DeFi ecosystem and your company's place in it. Sure. So I'm at Corey Kaplan three at, uh, on Twitter. Our website is dolomite.io. You can see how it's spelled on the stage there. And um, happy to interact with people via Twitter, email as well. My email is Corey at dolomite.io after this, and I'll be hanging around the conference. Happy to chat more about DeFi and other things going on in the larger crypto ecosystem. And I am Clanthia uh, with three A's on Twitter. Very hard to find another Clanthia. So if you search, you'll definitely find me. And you can also follow Masa Finance at Get Masa Fi um, on Twitter. We are launching a lot of very cool stuff in the next couple of weeks leading up to the holiday season. We're going to open up our DevNet, which allows anyone to be able to build upon Masa Soban identity. You can be a DAO wanting to use SBT for DAO governance voting. You can be an NFT project who's using SBT to build your allow list, prevent civil attack. And you can be a DeFi lending protocol who's tapping into our Web3 credit score to do better risk assessment. Or you can be <laughs> JP Morgan who is trying to do better KYC using Masa Soban identity. So please reach out to me if you're building interested, interesting stuff in the Web3 space and wanting to leverage identity. Thank you.